representing the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences. I am also in the Department of uh, Geography and Environmental Sustainability, and I am privileged enough to be on the Faculty Advisory Committee at Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. The exhibit is titled Galileo's World, an Artful Observation of the Cosmos. Each podcast will have artful conversations with experts in their fields, from the Norman OU campus to find out how their disciplines, including art, science, philosophy, and of course many more, bridge Galileo's world to our own. Today our featured guest is Todd Stewart. For many years, Todd Stewart's concerns as an artist have centered on the relationships between history, myth, and culture. Uh, This work has included a growing exploration of the American landscape and a continued engagement with the question, does place hold memory? Stewart is uh, the author of two books in particular, Placing Memory, a Photographic Exploration of Japanese American Internment, and Picture Oklahoma, Catastrophe, Memory, and Trauma. Stewart's photographs have been exhibited widely throughout the United States, recognized by museum curators at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego, and publication editors, including those from Time, Aperture, and the New York Times Magazine. Todd uh, began his career as a photographer working for advertising and design clients in Columbus, Ohio, and Atlanta, Georgia. Currently, he is an associate professor of art, technology, and culture in the School of Art and Art History at the University of Oklahoma, where he teaches courses in photography, digital imaging, and the history of photography. Well, welcome, Todd. I know that we have been through the exhibits and uh, looked at a couple of things. I know that you were fascinated uh, by a particular book entitled uh, Der Monde, uh, a German edition, if you will, uh, regarding uh, methods and issues as far as documents and documenting uh, light, shadow, texture, things of that nature. Uh, it is a book by Naismith and Carpenter, which illustrates all of those relationships uh, between art and science in the 19th century. Uh, maybe your first initial thoughts, and then uh, maybe some other thoughts as far as that uh, publication is concerned. Sure. Um, well, the um, book is a German edition of an earlier English uh, version entitled The Moon, Considered as a Planet, a World and a Satellite, published in 1874 by James Naismith and James Carpenter. And it includes um, their, well, it includes uh, a collection of illustrations derived originally from photographs. I think there's only one of the actual moon itself in the uh, book, but a a, an assortment also of illustrations that are photographs of plaster models that Naismith and Carpenter made to photograph um, of the moon. And so it's kind of an interesting combination of fact and fiction and uh, illusion and um, talks a lot about that kind of relationship, as you said, between um, art and science in the 19th century. I know that uh, we'd also talked, I think, when we were uh, do, walking through the exhibit about uh, your first fascination on the moon, maybe some first uh, ideas on photography and and how, how all that fits in with, of course, uh, what you now, your profession is. Uh, maybe uh, what were your first thoughts and ideas and your photography, uh, if you will, of the moon? Have you Have you dabbled in any of that? Um, I've not really done any astronomical photography myself, but I, I think I've had a fascination with the moon going back uh, many, many years. I mean, my, one of my first memories is of sitting on the back of a station wagon outside a bathhouse at a state park in Ohio in 1969, watching the moon landing, watching another Ohio boy step in you know, that first foot on the moon, uh, Armstrong. So, um, you know, I've really kind of been fascinated by it for a long long time. Uh, And I think in particular the the book that we're talking about and discussing, um, I'm very interested in kind of the early period of photography and uh, meaning 19th century photography. And I think it's kind of a unique 
period in which both um, photography and science itself were, were in kind of a flux. Um, and there seems to be a lot of those issues kind of worked out in the book, from my perspective. So that, that leads to the question, you know, someone interested in the history of photography, uh, some of those illustrations in the book, you know, uh, why, why are they so significant? Well, um, I think, first of all, in the way that they're used in the book, um, they're used to support Naismith's argument um, regarding the formation of the craters on the moon. Naismith believed that those were created um, through volcanic activity. And so the photographs are really used to argue that point, um, not just as um, photographs of the moon, but as a particular part of the argument. So I think they, that's important. And, and why that's important is it points to, especially in the 19th century, the authority of the photograph, the belief that uh, embedded in a photograph is some sort of truth. So by using pho photography, it gives the argument itself authority. Um, so that's interesting to me. And then that combined with the fact that we're using photography to um, support the argument, but it's photography of things that are constructed. So they're not, uh, you know, documents the way we would think of them in the 21st century. Um, now, in the 19th century, the conventions of what was a photographic document, what was a scientific document, what even science or art was, um, were not all completely worked out yet. And that's really the last time in our history in which I think things were in such a flux that there's this really kind of wonderful kind of thing that happens where things aren't defined really what they are. And so the book is, for me, also a great illustration of that. I mean, the 19th century is a period in which amateur scientists, for example, can still contribute to the greater body of knowledge. Uh, it doesn't happen so much anymore that just somebody in his garage comes up with a new theory of how the earth was formed or something like that, but that was kind of the way, or at least a way, in which scientific knowledge was produced in the 19th century. Um, in regards to photography, photography was invented by two gentlemen scientists, William Henry Fox Talbot and Jacques-Louis Daguerre. Naismith himself is not a scientist, he's an engineer, and he builds a telescope, and he uses the telescope to study the moon, and creates this argument, this scientific argument, based on that. And it gains and has a following. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting things that are kind of played out in the book. This blending of art and science, uh, you know, Galileo is known to be the father of so many things. I mean, you know, uh, the father of scientific method or science, the father of, if you will, philosophy, the father of so many different things. And, um, you know, his importance and his impact um, are still resonating today. Uh, any thoughts on scientific method, the father of philosophy? Are you in the College of Arts and Sciences? No, we're in the College of Fine Arts. Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. how, how does that relate to Galileo and some of his discoveries um, as far as the process, as far as the science, as far as philosophies and things of that nature? Well, I think at this time, um, once again, Galileo, not in the 19th century, a couple of hundred years before working, is really relying on two things that I think are kind of embedded in you know, the nature of art and art making, and those are um, both observation and then uh, representation. And so Galileo's development of the telescope um, is an attempt to create a device that really can kind of focus I guess, so to speak, you know, your attention onto something visually, right? So um, really kind of observing and through the act of observing, hoping to learn something. And I think that that's one of the kind of foundations of art is that um, through really looking at something closely, we may be able to understand something else. And then representation is really that next kind of step is how do you then create something that um, can reflect on what you've learned. And so those two things together, I think, tied very much to Galileo. I think you've been, uh, I know you've been, as a matter of fact, through the rest of the exhibit, and uh, you, you touched upon the Apollo launch. You touched upon, uh, 
you know, some of the, there, there was a series of lithographs and there was a series of, uh, if you will, uh, other artifacts in that room, uh, representations, art representations. Uh, any any uh, comments on the Apollo launch and uh, maybe how that weaves in with what you're doing now or at least the idea of Galileo and his impact on, on us? I think that um, I was particularly drawn to the um, prints by Lowell Nesbitt um, the one that, uh, as a photographer, I suppose I'm really drawn to is the print derived from the photograph by, I believe it's Neil Armstrong, of his footprint on the moon. And I think that's a really powerful piece um, for, for several reasons. Um, I think, for me, thinking of that footprint, thinking about that photograph, thinking about the mark on the moon as all indexes of the kind of physical presence of Armstrong on the moon is um, really kind of powerfully conveyed through the photograph and then the prints by Nesbitt. And so I'm not sure if that answers the question why it's important to all of us. Uh, For you. But for me, uh, I'm very drawn to a representation of the thing itself, right? The footprint on the surface of the moon and what that represented for us in 1969 and what it represents for us now. Todd, I want to go back. Uh, I would like to go back to the Naismith and Carpenter uh, book, if you will, or that uh, illustrative book, and this idea of uh, beauty uh, and this idea of beauty, art, and that relationship as, you know, Galileo was uh, an artist, a mathematician, and uh, I know that we, we had sort of discussed that idea of beauty and, uh, if you will, subtleness dealing with that publication. Your thoughts? One of the wonderful things about the book for me, it's not so much um, how it addresses the nature of beauty, but it's how it addresses kind of a uh, contradictory notion in the 19th century as it relates to aesthetics called the sublime. And the sublime is described as a pleasurable experience that is derived from a confrontation with something that is uncomprehensible, unfathomable, um, awe-inspiring, um, the face of God, you know. So if we think of the sublime um, and as it's handled through artists in the ni- other artists in the 19th century, um, we've got very famous Western landscape painters like Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran, and we've got photographers working in the American West who are kind of dealing with similar uh, aesthetic sensibilities. And um, I feel like that there's that same kind of feeling that comes through in the images that are created uh, of the moon. Uh, And even the way in a few passages in the book that Naismith talks about his reaction to what that experience must be like, that it's incomprehensible, that it's frightening and pleasurable at the same time, uh, is really uh, interesting to me. So, Todd, uh, I want to thank you for for being with us today, talking about Beyond Galileo, if you will, this series of podcasts. Uh, any other observations, any other comments, any other reflections, anything else that, that comes to your mind uh, as, we, as we wrap this uh, up? Well, I think it's a really wonderful exhibition that ties a lot of things together, how um, many different ways that uh, so much of, as it relates to philosophy, art, and science can be followed back to Galileo is, is um, really well kind of described in the exhibit. It's a really, really wonderful exhibit. And we're lucky to have it here. I, I think so. And uh, I encourage uh, folks listening to view the exhibit, uh, come to the Fred Jones Jr. Museum. And again, Todd, I thank you so much for being Thanks, with Gary. us. Thank you.